Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Keratoconus Foundation webinar. Our topic for today's um, lecture is eye drops for the treatment of keratoconus. We have a very special speaker with us today, and I'm gonna start off with giving you a little background about Dr. Vala Mbadi. He earned his medical degree from Mount Sinai School of Medicine at the age of 17, becoming the world's youngest doctor. After completing a residency in ophthalmology at Harvard University, he completed his fellowship at Duke in cornea and refractive surgery, and then getting his PhD in cell biology at the Medical College of Georgia. He then eventually went to um, pr practice for five years prior to moving to the University of Utah. Then after nine years, moved to private practice in Eugene, Oregon, where he is now broadcasting live from. He is president of the Pacific Clear Vision Institute and professor at the University of Oregon. He's a corneal specialist with a research focus in angiogenesis. So between clinic and research, his most significant basic science research advances have been the identification of a, a modulator here as the prime mediator of corneal avascularity. So he's gonna talk today a little bit more about his very interesting research. He's been awarded numerous awards, including Research to Prevent Blindness Physician Scientist Award, the ARVO Award for Macular Degeneration Research, and multiple others. He's been recognized for his teaching excellence by University of Utah Resident and Research Mentor Award, and also by serving as instructor as the Harvard Cataract Course for a couple years as well. He's just done so much amazing work in the field of ophthalmology and we're very lucky to have Dr. Embody here tonight. I, my name is Dr. Gloria Chu. I'm an optometrist from the USC Roski Eye Institute in Los Angeles and I will be moderating our uh, talk this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bala Embody and his discussion and uh, very exciting talk on eye drops for the treatment of keratoconus. Dr. Embody. Thank you so much. Uh, pleasure to uh, meet you, Dr. Chu, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, everyone, I apologize for the backyard setting. I uh, have COVID, so I'm on quarantine at home. Uh, so if uh, it gets too windy, let me know, I can speak up. Um, as uh, Dr. Chu noted, I uh, uh, have been in practice for about 20 years and have a variety of research interests. And uh, in the last uh, seven years, we've uh, made a lot of progress on developing a novel treatment for keratoconus, which I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share with you this evening. So, um, I do want everyone to know that uh, there is a startup company that I started called Ivina, in which I have a, a financial interest as a co-founder. Uh, and uh, the product's name is IVMed80. Uh, and uh, we believe it'll be the first pharmacologic non-surgical approach for corneal crosslinking. Um, as everybody knows, um, in keratoconus, uh, the cornea uh, is bulging out because it's weak. Uh, the corneal stroma, the protein fibers in the middle of the cornea are, are um, uh, biomechanically weak. And this onset, this disease onset tends to begin in the teens and 20s and worsens till about age 45. It can cause significant loss of vision, uh, light sensitivity and glare, uh, and uh, over time, it can uh, lead to corneal scarring or rupture requiring corneal transplant. And the purpose of our IVMed AD therapy is to flatten the cornea by increasing an enzyme called LOX, lysyl oxidase, to make the, more cornea, make the cornea more round. Currently, the treatment of surgical cross-linking is standard of care for keratoconus patients. This involves scraping the cornea 
and then zapping it with ultraviolet light after soaking it with a riboflavin solution for about an hour. Um, because you're causing a full corneal abrasion, <clears throat> this can lead to significant pain for weeks, uh, infection, haze and scarring for months, uh, visual fluctuation for about a year. And because it is a surgical treatment, um, insurance coverage remains quite a bit of a challenge. It remains uh, very expensive. Um, and there's a treatment called Intax, which uh, reduces astigmatism, but because of the inflammation of cross-linking, uh, it's hard to do Intax at the same time as cross-linking. And so that leads to the need for a separate surgical procedure. So before we get into <clears throat> the novel therapy, IV med 80 therapy, I just wanna lay out a, a, a framework for what we know about keratoconus treatment. It's very important to stop eye rubbing. Uh, uh, I provide anti-allergy drops as needed and I educate the patient. Sometimes I let the uh, spouse or significant other know that if they see their husband or wife with keratoconus rub their eyes, that they can charge them a quarter. That seems to be pretty effective. Um, Intax can help uh, normalize contour and reduce astigmatism and myopia. Um, cross-linking or surgical cross-linking stops progression. And um, specialty contact lenses, scarlet lenses, hybrids, piggybacks, uh, they have uh, made a tremendous difference in uh, vision and optical rehabilitation. So things that Dr. Chu and her uh, optometry colleagues are really experts in have made a tremendous contribution to the management of keratoconus. And then in advanced disease, uh, corneal transplant is still necessary. So um, some things to remember, basically our goals for keratoconic patients are to stop progression and hopefully avoid the need for a transplant if at all possible. If you can get the patient to about age 40 or 45 without needing a transplant, it's highly unlikely they'll ever need one. We do want to improve uh, uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity and uh, ability to wear contact lenses. Uh, but none of what we do is LASIK. None of what we do can expect a goal of uncorrected 2020 vision. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so let's get into the, uh, the heart of the talk. I mentioned to you that IV Med 80 increases LOX. Lysyl oxidase or LOX is an enzyme that is reduced in keratoconic patients and uh, it has a necessary cofactor, copper. And um, what LOX copper do is they form bonds in the matrix between cells in the corneal stroma. And by doing that, it takes those collagen proteins and cross-links them physiologically. And this is a natural enzyme that's present uh, throughout the population. And when it um, works, you get uh, an evidence or a biomarker called LNL, lysyl norleucine. That's the actual cross-linked amino acid or cross-link between the amino acids lysine and leucine. Um, in keratoconus, there's a natural deficiency of corneal cross-links. There's various mutations in keratoconic families. There's a reduction of copper in keratoconic patients' corneas that have been removed at the time of corneal transplant. And further, LOX was reduced in tissues from patients who underwent a refractive surgery called SMILE, who then developed keratoconus uh, subsequently. So I think there's very strong genetic biomechanical and anatomic uh, evidence that LOX activity reduction reduces natural corneal collagen crosslinks. And so about seven years ago, we came up with an idea, well, can we enhance LOX? Can we enhance natural crosslinks of corneal collagen? And that's exactly what IV Med 80 does. Our very first experiment was uh, looking at uh, cells from normal corneas versus cells from uh, patients who lost their corneas from keratoconus at the time of corneal transplant. And what we found was that in the absence of treatment in cell culture, that keratoconic corneal cells, as you would expect, had a lot less LOX expression 
than normal corneal cells. With treatment, with IV med 80, we were able to substantially increase LOX activity in cell culture, comparable to what normal corneal cells could do. So that was our very first experiment in this area. It was a cell culture experiment. The results demonstrated that we could promote LOX activity with treatment uh, using IV med 80 in keratoconic corneal cells. <clears throat> we then took a series of um, keratoconic corneas, again, uh, derived at the time of corneal transplantation, and found, as other researchers had before, that LNL, the slicyl north leucine, that <clears throat> biomarker of cross-linked amino acids, was substantially reduced compared to normal human corneas. We then began uh, animal studies and found that we could increase LNL and therefore collagen cross-linking in the rabbit cornea uh, using IV med 80 over the course of six weeks compared to both uh, control untreated uh, rabbits as well as rabbits that received uh, just vehicle artificial tears. And then we wanted to measure whether we could affect rabbit corneal shape. And so, uh, we used a handheld corneal topographer. Um, we uh, numbed the rabbit eyes and we were able to assess uh, what happened to the rabbit corneal shape after uh, treatment. All of these uh, rabbits are, are anesthetized. And at the end of the study, they're adopted out. Uh, no harm befalls these rabbits. These rabbits were selected because there's no animal model for keratoconus. However, the rabbit cornea is similar in shape and thickness to a human patient with keratoconic corneas. It's a little bit thinner than the normal human. It's a little bit steeper than the normal human. It's very similar to keratoconic measurements. So it's the probably the best animal model for studying rabbit uh, for studying keratoconic shape. <clears throat> and what we found was terrific. We found that using three different doses of IV med 80 eye drops were, was able to flatten the rabbit cornea one and a half to 1.8 diopters, similar to what UV surgical cross-linking did and much better than any of the controls. So then we studied human donor corneas and we looked at um, stress strain curves or biomechanics. So we had two pairs of donor corneas and found that treatment with IV med 80 substantially improved the uh, inflation pressure to strain ratio compared to the untreated uh, donor mates of uh, pairs of donor corneal um, given by the eye bank. Then we uh, completed a safety study in, in uh, Dutch belted rabbits. Uh, this was you know, necessary prior to going to a clinical trial and found that there were no surface abnormalities. There was uh, no accumulation of plasma copper. There was no uh, uh, adverse effects noted in any of the blood tests and uh, that these drops were very well tolerated in the rabbit eye. <clears throat> In 2019, uh, we commenced, based on all of the preceding cell culture and animal work, a phase 1-2A first in human clinical trial. Uh, and uh, this was completed uh, by Dr. Arturo Shayet's group in Tijuana, Mexico. And um, the study design uh, involved use of three different subarms. There was one group of patients that received placebo eye drops for 16 weeks, another group of patients that received IV med 80 eye drops for 16 weeks, and another group of patients that received IV med 80 eye drops for six weeks. Everybody got followed 26 weeks. So this was a six month observation period. And the reason we set up these three subarms this way was to help assess the impact of duration of therapy as well as to see what happens after cessation of therapy. There were no significant differences in gender or age or uh, mean uh, K-max or steep keratometry at baseline. Um, 
the, we enrolled uh, 38 patients, seven of them dropped out, uh, most of them for COVID reasons. Uh, we started in 2019 and we completed the trial in 2021. So we did have some issues with the COVID pandemic. Uh, one uh, patient dropped out um, for pregnancy, but 31 patients completed the trial. <clears throat> so the top line result was as follows that patients who received placebo eye drops got a little bit worse, about 0.2 uh, diopters over uh, the course of 26 weeks of observation, whereas the patients who received IV med 80 for the full 16 weeks had about 0.8 diopters of flattening. So this was the first evidence that we were seeing in humans of pharmacologic corneal flattening without light, without surgery, just using eye drops. When you look at all three groups, the, uh, the IV mint 80 drop uh, patients that received the drops for six weeks, they had a little bit of early effect, but nothing durable. Whereas the patients who received the drops for 16 weeks had a persistent uh, uh, reduction of KMAX that was durable even after stopping treatment. When we break down the uh, subjects uh, by responder analysis, what we found was that every single patient who received IV med 80 for 16 weeks either stayed the same on KMAX or improved. None of them got worse in KMAX, whereas patients in the other groups sometimes did get worse. We then looked at best corrected visual acuity. Um, and uh, what we noted was that um, even patients who uh, received placebo eye drops had improved uh, visual acuity over the course of six months. And this is a very no well-known phenomenon in clinical trials. And the reason is that these patients are being able to read, they're being asked to read the ETDRS eye chart every time every visit over the course of six months. So they memorize the letters. So the placebo patients improved by eight letters. The patients who received IV med 80 drops on average improved by 7.9 letters. And this is very consistent with prior published results in a variety of clinical trials. Over six months, patients do tend to memorize the eye charts. Um, <clears throat> however, the patients who received IV med 80 drops for 16 weeks had the most visual acuity improvement, 11.4 letters. Furthermore, uh, we noted reduction of corneal astigmatism at both, at both week 16 and week 26, and improvement on corneal biomechanics. In Mexico, they have a uh, instrument called the oculus corvus, and we found improvement of stress strain index and stiffest point highest curvature. So these, those are markers of corneal biomechanical strength. Very importantly, there was not a single treatment related adverse event. None of the patients in IVMAN 80 eye drops had any adverse events. One patient on the placebo arm uh, group developed a little bit of corneal inflammation that self resolved, um, but that was noted to be unrelated because it was three months after they stopped the placebo eye drops. So when we compare what we observed in our phase one two-way study with what has been published on Fotrexa, which is the currently accepted standard of care for surgical cross-linking, what we observe jumps out. One is that we have an early reduction in Kmax. Patients undergoing Fotrexa the cornea actually gets steeper in the first month. Further, at six months, we observed more flattening compared to Fotrexin. At six months, we observed greater improvement in visual acuity. And we avoid all of the side effects of surgery. Fotrexa had substantial side effects, uh, corneal haze and pain and light sensitivity and so on. When you look at the emerging landscape, um, obviously corneal transplant is for severe disease. Uh, refractive correction uh, doesn't treat the underlying pathophysiology. And epion crosslinking is an emerging alternative, but 
but both epi off and epi on cross-linking are uh, being restricted to the label of progressive keratoconus. And so that slows down treatment that presents an insurance reimbursement hurdle for physicians to overcome, and that affects the timeliness of therapy. Ivina, our company, is going for all stages and types. So our trial was not limited to progressive keratoconus, but rather to all comers. So this will be the first non-surgical uh, disease-modifying eye drop. Um, this already we've shown at a six-month observation period that we're able to flatten the FDA uh, the corneal curvature by one diopter. The FDA wants us to demonstrate that at one year, which we're very confident that we can do with a one-year study. Those uh, phase three studies are are are, are um, in the works. Um, Safety-wise, we're avoiding the surgical risk and, and expense of surgery. Um, we've gotten a green light from the FDA to enter into phase 2B slash 3 registration studies, and um, uh, we uh, actually have a strategic partner uh, to um, uh, take on those development costs. There will be an announcement on that uh, in less than a month. So um, uh, we have a very strong team. Uh, our scientific advisors include uh, multiple cornea specialists, uh, Richard Lindstrom, Vance Thompson, Ed Holland, uh, Jerry Hu, as well as Paul Karpecki from the optometric community. Um, and uh, we're very pleased to uh, move this uh, technology along to um, commercialization and, and availability to patients. So I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Okay, Dr. Embody, that was so fascinating for me. Um, I'm an optometrist who sees a lot of keratoconus patients at various stages myself, you know, mild, moderate, and advanced. Um, given that you know contacts tend to work for a lot of them as you alluded to specialty contacts have really changed i think how we approach management for at least optimizing vision mm -hmm. and as you mentioned in your talk you know really cross-linking is our only modality right now to halt or slow progression of this disease and there can be complications with the FDA approved version, which is uh, epi off and requires removal of the surface. So to have something that's you know being studied right now that is um, an eye drop, less invasive, and appears to have very minimal side effects is pretty exciting. Thank you. So a couple questions here from our audience. Who is eligible for this treatment? Meaning at what stage could a patient potentially take advantage of this? And I think maybe even before you get to answering that question, obviously you're still you know, in the research stages. When do you think this treatment option may become available to the public? Sure. So uh, the FDA requires us to uh, treat uh, 400 patients with the drug and have one year observation uh, along with a minimum of 200 control patients also with one year observation. Uh, and then they will also require six months of observation after stopping uh, the drug at one year. So it's a you know fairly extended phase three B uh, uh, phase three uh, trial process. They want two parallel trials uh, that will you know split up that pool of 600 patients. So looking at our timelines, uh, we would like to be able to uh, get this uh, study underway uh, within the next uh, nine months, and then uh, complete the. Uh, phase three studies, you know, enrollment and uh, treatment and observation statistical report um, by 2027. So hopefully by the end of 2020 uh, or mid 2027, um, you know, it, it would be approved um, and available on the market. Okay. 
and basically oh, okay. as far as uh, and uh, approval approval criteria you know the trial will go for anyone over age 18 once once the drug is approved physicians can use it off label for under 18 got it so given that now our goal is really to prevent progression at the earliest stage possible would these drops also be indicated for the earliest conditions just like cross-linking now to prevent progression or can you know as you know there's a um, minimal you know intraoperative thickness requirement for cross-linking because if it's too thin you could risk complications to the endothelium and you know the eye um, is could this be considered in moderate keratoconus patients with scarring you know advanced do we know yeah. now yeah i mean our, our goal is to offer it to anyone who the physician feels would benefit so there's not going to be a minimum corneal thickness criteria there's no risk to the endothelium from this eye drop um, certainly if someone has advanced corneal scarring they're most likely going to need a transplant, right? I mean, the, the, this isn't going to make the scarring going away. But um, if the physician feels that, uh, you know, stopping progression uh, pharmacologically will be a benefit, we want to make this available to, to them. And you also mentioned, you know, you can't do cross-linking and intacts at the same time. Would these drops be indicated before someone has intacts or maybe after to evaluate? Okay you know, the flattening effect from Intax already, or how would you order that? Yeah, I, I would or leave that up to clinical discretion of the physician. So uh, okay. the same time before or after, I, I don't think it will matter. Well, I mean, the eye drop, the length of treatment is at least 16 weeks, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we're gonna go for a one year approval just because that's what the FDA requires for the phase three study is a one-year treatment period. Um, and then um, as far as duration of treatment, once it's commercially available, as you know, um, keratoconus is pretty variable. Uh, younger patients tend to have uh, more severe progression over a longer period of time. And so someone who's diagnosed you know, in their teens or 20s you know, might need the drop for years. Somebody okay. who's older at diagnosis in the late, you know, late 30s, you know, maybe the physician feels happy after six months of treatment. You know, Got so it. Um, I, I think uh, it's going to be up to clinical discretion and clinical response uh, as to the duration of therapy. So I have a question: Is the degree of flattening uh, correlated to the length of time that you use it? Like, if you get flattening of, you know one diopter within six what, 16 weeks can you use it longer and get further flattening or is that something that hasn't been studied yet yeah we haven't studied that yet so that will be studied in the phase three studies fascinating so in comparing this with corneal cross-linking the iv med 80 drops it appears with your initial studies that it flattens the cornea. And I think that was your maybe initial goal, but then you also found that it stiffens the tissue like cross-linking so yeah. that perhaps it's it will have the same effect to halt and slow and also flatten. Um, okay, so. Yeah, yeah, we, were very, we were very pleased with the data. You know, we were not expecting reduction of corneal astigmatism. We found okay about half a after a reduction of corneal cylinder, which was nice. And um, corneal biomechanics studies, as you know, are, are very uh, noisy. So we were happy to find an effect even with just 31 patients. So we were very pleased with what we found. Another question, couple more questions. Would these drops potentially benefit those who already had um, cross-linking? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, it, I think it's a reasonable um, uh, thing to try, especially if someone has not had a uh, beneficial enough F effect from prior cross-linking. And how many drops or times per day are needed per eye? We were doing twice a day in the trial. Twice a day. And 
there are some questions about whether people can enroll in these clinical trials. Yeah, so where we are is as follows. Uh, I, I, I alluded to that we um, just, uh, Ivina as a small company, we just signed the uh, strategic license deal. That announcement should come out um, uh, August 8th or August 9th, so in less than a month. And um, the, the strategic partner will uh, lead the clinical development process. So their goals are to um, uh, do uh, US uh, phase three studies. So once we have uh, that underway, then uh, I'd be happy to share that with the NKCF community. Do you think there will be multiple um, sites where these tests are being? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be a 600 trial pool, 600 patient pool yeah. uh, that the FDA requires. So that will be multi center. Okay. Have you selected those centers yet? We have a list of people who are interested, uh, but ultimately our partner is the one who's going to have to um, make the decision on the trial sites. Okay. So, yeah, definitely we have a very, I think, eager. Um, group of our keratoconus patients here, um, many who maybe have had cross-linking, maybe couldn't get insurance coverage. Um, and I think for our younger generation of keratoconus patients or children of those patients who have keratoconus now, this is very, um, seems very promising and very exciting. Yeah, yeah I uh, think the number of keratoconic patients is increasing dramatically. I feel like our diagnostics are better and yeah. uh, patients um, are coming in at earlier stages, whereas previously they would just be, you know, tweaked with contact lenses. They're, they're right. coming in and being diagnosed. Absolutely. I think with more and more optometrists specifically, since they tend to do more primary eye care, more offices have topographers and tomographers now. And as you know, you know, early keratoconus can be easily missed right. um, with just refraction and slit lamp. And I think if we're able to do more imaging with topography and tomography, we're going to catch these cases at a much earlier stage. And I, I mean, I think it's a very exciting time for keratoconus patients because we also have genetic testing that might be able to you know, hone in on patients who are at higher risk. And if we can determine that, then maybe we can direct them to treatment sooner. Yeah, that's so, a great point. I'd, I'd like to just pivot on that for a second and encourage the um, keratoconic uh, audience, you know, if they have uh, children in the preteens or, or teens or 20s to encourage them to go to an office that has, as you know, uh, as you noted, tomography and, and possibly genetic testing uh, and topography to see if their child has keratoconus. Because earlier diagnosis allows earlier intervention and a much better long-term prognosis. Of course. So I'm not sure if you have the answer to this question, but any idea of the expected cost or whether this might be covered by insurance? Uh, well, certainly this should be covered by insurance. We, we've in our market research, we um, met with uh, uh, I think six different insurance companies um, that represent 40 million lives in the U.S. and they all said this would be covered by insurance. Um, hmm. So you know there was a, an eagerness from the insurance side for a non-surgical treatment because uh, an eye drop is almost certainly going to be cheaper than surgery. Um, so uh, I, I think this would be covered by insurance. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, that's impossible for me to predict right. at this time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I didn't think so, but somebody did ask the question, so Fair I wanted question. to <laughs> convey that. Um, you know, I think this is such a new um, and kind of novel treatment that our keratoconic population and many I care doctors themselves, you know, don't know what to think. And I think one important point to get across to our audience today is that 
this treatment is not available yet. So don't go calling your doctor and saying, I need the IV Med 80 drops that Dr. Embody talked about yesterday because they are still um, being investigated and studied and the response in our patients and what happens in their eyes still has to be rigorously tested. Right. And it minimum, as you said, um, will be at least five years before we can potentially get these drugs out on the market. Is that right? About 20, you said 2027 or so? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would like to think that um, we've had a tremendous outpouring of inquiries along the way as people have heard of our products. So there's a lot of patients out there who are asking to be in the clinical trial and so on. Um, you know, our challenge so far has been, you know, money to get this phase three studies underway. That has been solved with the strategic license agreement. And then um, I would like to think that uh, soon after this announcement in August that our partners uh, will be uh, in a good position to um, get these uh, studies underway early next year. So once the U.S. trials are underway, then interested patients who are motivated to participate in a clinical trial can seek out a trial site. As far as commercial approval, 600 patients, you know, one to one and a half years of follow-up, all of the enrollment and statistical uh, review by the FDA, that adds considerable time. You know, yep, for the sure. Process, the process to get approved. And so uh, everything goes well. Hopefully 2027, it'll be on the market for, you know, prescriber availability. Just some practical questions. Does the drop burn? Does it have any side effects, including redness, itching, tearing, like a lot of our medications yeah, now? Great, yeah, great question. So none of the patients in the trial reported any adverse events, no stinging or redness. I put the drop in myself before we did the trial. I put a drop in both of my eyes before you know, we actually started anyone on it. And it just felt like an artificial tear. You know, okay. it was, yeah, that was you know, no pain, no redness. So I don't know if this has also been considered, as you know, Intax was initially approved for the treatment of myopia and flattening the cornea. Will this drop have any role in kind of like treating myopia a little bit if it flattens the cornea in keratoconus patients? Great question. So Ivina um, has a separate pipeline for treatment of pediatric myopia, uh, where we're developing a different molecule. Uh, it also increases LOX, but it increases LOX not just in the cornea, but in the sclera. Oh, so fascinating. Different, yeah, we have a different product called Ivy Med 85, which uh, we're developing for the treatment of pediatric myopia by increasing scleral crosslinking and LOX as well as the corneal uh, tissue. So uh, that will be a different uh, uh, product that is that's going to be a much longer process. So sure. uh, FDA wants three years of study on a pediatric product uh, with one year of follow-up after uh, three years of therapy. The FDA wants 900 uh, children mm -hmm. enrolled. So um, that, that product development is going to be a much longer uh, process. And there's another question that just came in. Would, dry, would eye drops for dry eye, or I'm just gonna take it to another level, eye drops that patients are on for glaucoma or other um, eye conditions interfere with the IV med 80 treatment? Um, I don't think dry eye treatment would affect IV med 80. The, the vehicle for uh, IV med 80 is uh, aqueous, you know, saline, you know, artificial tear type solution. Um, glaucoma eye drops, um, if anything, I would expect them, you know, to increase availability. Glaucoma eye drops tend to have BAK, yep. which um, uh, open up epithelial pores. So if anything, I would expect glaucoma eye drops to perhaps increase efficacy of, of the copper crossing into the corneal stroma. Um, so that would be my take on that. We haven't studied that question. Uh, you know, generally most patients with keratoconus don't have glaucoma, sure. but you know. True. 
Uh, I think there was one more question, but I think we've answered this already. Someone asked if you have a more severe case of keratoconus and you're older, could potentially these drops still be useful? And I think you said, I mean, if there's severe scarring, how much you know, progression are we trying to avoid? It's already progressed. So right. Right. I think you know, the sooner we can get to our keratoconus patients and treat them, I'm guessing that would be better. Yeah, I mean, I, I think each individual patient is going to be different. That needs to be a consultation with their physician. Uh, you know, my general thought as a cornea specialist is that um, if there's corneal scarring or high drops or, you know, really advanced disease, they're going to need a transplant. Um, but in the absence of that, uh it's worth a shot to see if flattening the cornea somewhat can improve the vision. It's worth a shot if flattening the cornea in combination with intacts, uh, you know, can get the person to a point where contact lenses work. Um, right. So um, I think those are all reasonable things that um, uh, the doctor should work with the patient. In my practice, uh, as a near practice, I, I'm very fortunate to work alongside uh, uh, optometrists, you know, side by side in the office, uh, who have you know expertise in specialty contact lenses, and so mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that's the same way for you at, at USC. Yeah. And, and um, I think that's really key for patients with keratoconus who are suffering to seek out uh, offices where there's really good collaboration between the ophthalmologist and optometrist. Uh, to help uh, guide this um, treatment decision planning. Completely agree. I actually work within the cornea service, the same hallway. Likewise. And if there's something that I just need a quick kind of consult, sometimes I'll just say, hey, right. can you come over and, and look at this really quick. And, you know, same, I'll introduce myself and say, you know, what, I look forward to seeing you for you know, specialty contact lens consult. So I think collaboration is really key. And one final question, currently, you know, cross-linking is performed by ophthalmologists. Do you see any role of optometrists being able to prescribe this drop? Yeah, absolutely. Our goal is to make this eye drop available to any eye care provider qualified to prescribe it. Now, there are certain states that uh, require you know certain hurdles for certain eye drops. Dr. Karpecki is on our advisory board, and he's helping us uh, navigate the plan for scope of practice in, in in certain of these states. But he's told us that he feels that in the vast majority of states, getting prescription authorization for this eye drop for optometrists is not going to be a problem. That's very exciting for so. myself. As an optometrist, yeah, no, I, mean, I, I don't want to restrict this to just ophthalmologists. I think you know, the, more, the more doctors can prescribe this, the more patients can get treated earlier. So definitely. Well, we have answered all our questions, and I just thank you so much for sharing your research results, um, your what's in the pipeline for upcoming studies to get this treatment FDA approved. We know that there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done. But it's very exciting to know that, you know, research is continually being done in the area of keratoconus so that we can better serve and better help our patients. So thank you so much for your time, your background, your sound quality, everything turned out perfectly. Thank I you. wish I had a tree like that in my background, but I just have crooked blinds. So um, thank I want you. A tree or a plum tree. We have a golden plum tree in the, on that side. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. Thank you again for giving this um, amazing talk. Even when you're not 100%, it came out perfectly. So we, I, myself, National Keratoconus Foundation, and all our audience members today, thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing what's to come in the next couple of years. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Gloria, and, and also so much. to Mary for inviting me. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.